Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, again, um, welcome. Uh, this is going to be a, a bit of a developer talk, but it's going to be about reference counter multidimensional arrays for C++, a really long title, I now realize. Um, but I hope as we go along, it'll become clear what, uh, what I'm actually trying to do here. So what we're talking about is a, uh, an essential data type in scientific computing that has caused me uh, great headaches uh, in the past in, uh, when trying to use C++, and those are multidimensional arrays. Um, and these data types occur in all kinds of scientific computing. Uh, they occur heavily in artificial intelligence. Uh, those are the tensors of TensorFlow. Um, computational fluid dynamics, optimizations, uh, molecular dynamics, many, many computational applications have this thing called a multidimensional array. Um, what are these things? Well, they're essentially just a set of values of the same type organized in a grid. So we've got this regular rectangular looking grid like the one on the right here, six by six by six. And each of these boxes is supposed to contain a value of a similar type. So whether that is an integer or a double or some uh, more complicated structure doesn't really matter as long as they're all the same. I uh, just, um, when I'm talking about these arrays, I will talk about their rank. The rank is actually the number of dimensions. So in this case, on the right here, that would be three. Um, and that is different from the rank of a matrix in case you're thinking of that. Um, the sizes of or, or no, of each dimension, I will call extents. And so we've got <clears throat> a data type that has different extents in different directions. The number of directions, the number of dimensions is also called the rank. Um, the reason I have to sort of go over that is that this kind of representation of how you call these things is actually not that standard or universal. Uh, so I just want to get that, uh, that cleared up. Um, So if you want to have an example in your, uh, in your head, sort of what we're talking about here, think about you're doing some sort of a, uh, maybe it's a, a weather simulation or a climate simulation, and you have a three-dimensional grid by, of 200 by 300 by 20, which might be the temperature values over uh, uh, the, of the atmosphere over a piece of land, right? And um, so it's a sampling of that piece of the atmosphere and uh, maybe 200 in longitude, 300 in light latitude, and 20 up in terms of layers. Um, that could be a very, that's a very typical thing that might happen if you're doing simulations of that kind. And so that's the kind of multidimensional arrays you want to be able to, uh, to deal with. So why has this given me so much uh, trouble? Um, why am I going on about this seemingly simple data type and that's because a big part of my job is actually to do training and teaching. And so I train and teach on scientific computing. And um, I like to do that in the C++ language. Uh, in Python, if it's more introductory, but definitely if we are talking about performance, you want to have a compiled language. And um, yeah, let me show you why that is an issue. Uh, why it shouldn't be an issue actually comes from the history of, of, of things. So let's look at the very history of scientific computing in, uh, in two slides, or maybe three. Um, electronic computers came about towards the end of, of World War II. And um, very quickly after that, and you can imagine what they were used for, uh, quickly after that, the scientific computing uh, people arose and said, hey, we'd like to use this for scientific computing. And so very quickly, people were trying to do scientific computing uh, computations on electronic computers. Uh, now, initially, these computers had to be programmed in machine code. And not too long after, in assembly language, which is kind of a codification of the machine code. But that is not ideal. Uh, first of all, it's rather cumbersome. Um, there are no abstractions. So everything is just in terms of whatever the chips can, can naturally understand. Uh, but it also was a machine dependent code. So every machine you got, you had to re, uh, reprogram it or rewrite re, uh, your code in its machine code. And that is uh, and, no, not a good thing. So it didn't took too long, but it was a major step forward when Fortran was developed. And so, yes, this is a talk about C++, but I have to mention Fortran because uh, it got a, a couple of things really right from the start. 
So Fortran was meant to offer these abstractions, offer ways to uh, translate formulas, that's where the Fortran comes from, into machine language, but then the, the Fortran part of it could be ported into different machines and you just had to compile it for that, uh, that other machine. And the reason it's mentioned in this talk is that from the very start, uh, Fortran supported multidimensional arrays. And that is understandable if it's a language for scientific computing. And so even in Fortran 4, uh, which nobody programs in anymore, I would hope, uh, and stemmed from 1961, you could have a two-dimensional array, A uh, here, it's a 10 by 10 uh, matrix, and you could fill it, you could uh, index it with these uh, round brackets, I comma J, and you could write loops. Loops look a little bit funny if you have never seen old Fortran, uh, but that's how they, they went. But the point is that you had native support for multidimensional arrays. Now, it took a little while for this uh, language to modernize, but people do still write in Fortran 90 or um, very close derivatives, and the language looks very different. Uh, one of the main features that were added um, as, a, as a standard in, in 1990 is that you could allocate arrays. And we'll, we'll look at why that is a, a, an important difference, but <coughs> excuse me, if you don't know the size of your array at, beforehand, before the, the program runs, um, it has to be able to allocate this memory uh, um, as, uh, at runtime. And so this is what's happening here, this allocatable keyword, make sure that this A is initially undefined how big it is, then you allocate it and you can use it. Other than that, it's pretty simple. Um, you have to deallocate when you're done because otherwise you might have a, a memory leak. But other than that, this is, this is a small extra thing you would have to do to make sure that you can have a, a dynamically defined array already in 1990. Okay, so we're gonna go into C++, but we have to start by uh, looking at its parent language, C, uh, which started in 1978, around about. Uh, all my uh, dates have a dash at the end because it hasn't ended yet. Uh, people are still programming in C, people are still programming in Fortran, and people are still programming in C++, we will get to that. Um, but what C is supposed to be is also a general purpose computing uh, computer programming language. So the same idea as Fortran in that you don't have to rewrite your program if you have to run it on a different computer, you just have to compile for that. Um, but it's, it's more general purpose, it's not meant for scientific computing per se. And so the support of multidimensional arrays in C is weird. Um, it supports multidimensional arrays that are static, and I'll explain what static means, but not dynamic. And so if you don't know at compile time what, uh, what size your array is, at least back in the old days, um, there was no way to dynamically uh, uh, allocate it within the language. So I'll show you what, what you do have to do. And, and that was fine in a sense, because C was a systems language. So I didn't need all those scientific computing multidimensional arrays anyway. Um, people were quite happy with it as it was. Um, one of the nice things of being a systems language is that software libraries uh, link very naturally into it. So if you have a library um, and you want to use it, uh, it's probably, if, even if it's not written in C, it's, it's got a C interface and you can interface with it quite, quite naturally because it's essentially the same um, language. So the static or also called automatic arrays are uh, deceptively simple. So here's a, a little snippet that would do uh, a 10 by 10 array of floating point numbers. Um, and it's static in the sense that um, you know at compile time what the, the sizes are. And that's what this pound defined does. Um, and it's automatic in the sense that if this were in some sort of a function, then when the function ends, it automatically uh, allocates and deallocates the, the array. So um, in most cases where I'm talking about it here, they're both, they're static and automatic, and I will use them interchangeably, although they are different concepts. And so that's nice. It's very similar to the Fortran case where you say, okay, here's, um, here's my dimensions of my array and I can just use them. 
at the syntax is with these uh, repeated square brackets. So the, the row index comes first and then the column index if you have matrices. And this uh, just generalizes to any number of dimensions. So that, that is nice. Uh, and I wish that was uh, all there was to it because if that was the case, we would not be uh, here. Um, but what happens is that for large enough N, so for large enough sizes, this will just break and it will break sort of in an odd way um, either your program gets killed or you get a seg segmentation fault or it doesn't really tell you why. Um, and the reason why this happens is that automatic arrays are allocated on a piece of memory called the stack. Now, there is only one memory. Um, so the distinction between stack and the other kind, which is heap, is artificial uh, to some extent in the physical memory, but it is not artificial in how the operating system views it. And so the operating system gives you only a limited amount of stack. And how much that is depends on the operating system. It depends on your settings. You can tweak with that. Um, in some cases, it can depend on the compiler, but typically it does not. And so you do not know for what size array this is going to work for you. You can have a code that is perfectly valid C code. This code is perfectly valid C code. Um, you ran it for a small test case, fantastic. Now you run it at your big test case and it's segmentation fault. And you have no idea why, because it's still the same code. So these arrays are in a sense evil. You do not know when they're gonna break um, and uh, that's not something we want. So you can change this, but you might not have the ability to do that um, in, on every system that you're given. So it's an unpredictable failure mode. Um, so instead, what you would like to do is, is create a dynamic array. So you just presume that you do not know the N, although it's headed here, and you just allocate an array that you want to act just like this, uh, uh, this automatic array on the left. Uh, so the inner part, the inner loop is the same. That's great, syntax is the same. And to get that done, you have to do these trickeries. I'm not even going through it. What you're doing here is allocating an array of pointers that points to rows, and then each row you have to allocate. Or uh, a better way is uh, you allocate that array of pointers, then you allocate the whole block of the actual data you want, and then you manipulate the pointers to point in the right way, such that if you do repeated square brackets, um, you actually get the desired effect. What is good about this is that um, the, the, the only response you have on the, the size of your array is how much memory you actually have. And if you have a, a system that uh, allows swapping onto your hard drive, it actually is uh, restricted to how much hard drive uh, space you have, although that becomes very slow. So once you've initialized it, it's fine. So a lot of old C codes would have functions that allocate an array and then other functions that deallocate it. And you do that once and you work with your arrays. And it's true, that kind of works. Um, and there's a reason why you do it this way. You want your indexing to be the same as the static ones, but there is some pointer chasing going on. So every time you, you access a number, you, uh, you dereference a pointer. And again, um, that depending on how big everything is, can, can be a performance hit. Um, so those are uh, those are some issues with this. So that's sort of what you would have to do in C. Um, we don't program in C if we uh, if we can uh, help it. Uh, we go to its better uh, successor, and better is very subjective here. So uh, this is all my opinion, I guess. Uh, but we have C plus plus, and C plus plus is a fairly old language. Uh, in a sense too. It started in 85, it started as C with classes. So um, C was taken and then we added some object oriented programming to it. And uh, those were called the classes and now it's a, but that's how it started. Um, it's now a much larger language than C that has many different paradigms in it. And you would think with all of those uh, uh, successes that it would be easier to use multi-dimensional arrays. And what I will show is that that's not quite the case at least as of yet. Um, one of the advantages of C++ and one of the, one of the reasons I use it in my classes is that um, you, you find usage for C++ also outside of scientific computing. So it's, if students go on and they don't uh, take the academic track and they find themselves somewhere else, 
Um, they are unlikely to find, say, Fortran code, but they're likely to find some C++ code. And so why not? Because when you look at like performance, they're almost on par. Uh, Fortran and C++ depends really heavily on the application. Um, C++ is sort of compatible with C at a, at a large extent. And so you can get this low level uh, performance stuff if you need it. Uh, you can also get high level, so you can have all kinds of abstractions. Um, and so we're kind of trying to do a little bit of high level with the multi-dimensional arrays. Uh, because it's still based on C, um, it interfaces well with software libraries. So we like that. Although if those software libraries are C libraries, you're going to have to use like pointers and stuff. But uh, so you lose some of the abstraction. Uh, but still, it's, it's a fairly uh, smooth way. OK, so static or automatic arrays are just inherited from, uh, from C. Um, the N doesn't have to be known at compile time, although for modern C, that is also the case. Um, and so again, this can fail in some somewhat unpredictable ways. Uh, the dynamic array looks very similar, and it is exactly structured the same. C++ added some ways to, uh, to allocate memory within the language with the new and the delete uh, keywords. Uh, but that is an improvement, because with the malloc, uh, you, you rely on a library to do this to do this for you at least this is part of the language um so that's that's good and um, and then uh, c++ come with other stuff that can help you with this in principle and so one of those things is a vector uh, vector is in the standard library and um, you can get um, a vector of a vector and that creates sort of a matrix so that's what i'm doing here i'm creating a vector of vectors of floats um, the number of rows i start with is n then for each of the rows, I make sure I have n numbers in those rows, and then I can use it. It's better in the sense that it automatically reallocates your memory. Um, so that's smart. Um, and that the syntax is the same as either the dynamic or the automatic arrays. So that's OK. Uh, but we still kind of have to allocate each row separately. And why that is tricky is because now that we do these allocations separately, um, the data itself, so A, I, J for uh, all ranges of I and J are necessarily in one big block in memory. And for some things that matter, they can matter for performance, but it can also matter for trying to interface with software libraries. So if you want to, for instance, take a Fourier transform of this array and you want to use FFTW, it expects a pointer to your data and the data needs to be just linearly laid out in memory. And this one won't do that. Um, a second, uh, thing that I haven't mentioned yet is one of the the nice things pointers on the side, although it's annoying, is that if you pass that pointer to a function, it doesn't make a copy. And so if this is a big array, you don't want every function to make a copy. You lose that with vectors. Um, you can get around it, obviously, with, with using references. But if you make a copy of a vector, it copies the whole vector. So it, it behaves in that sense differently from the other arrays. Um, anyway, we'll get to that later. Um, okay, so that's our C++ initial standard. And so um, I didn't like that. I had to teach dynamic arrays in my courses and people got uh, tripped up. Try generalizing this to a 3D array gets, gets hairy. Um, and of course, there's many solutions out there and I'm gonna not talk about any of them uh, for lack of time, um, but before we get into anything, what do we really want? Like, we're not happy with this, or I wasn't. This is too complicated. This doesn't quite do uh, uh, what I want. Um, static array, so no static arrays doesn't fit my bill. Dynamic doesn't fit the bill. Vectors. Why not? What do I really want? Um, well, let's look at it. And so this is this is uh, also at the same time because I'm we're moving towards a, uh, a fairly. Uh, to a library that I wrote to deal with these things that does just uh, just enough to give multidimensional arrays a good chance. Um, what do we want? So first, I want to rethink this idea of a multidimensional array. So in, in C and C++, these multidimensional arrays um, are viewed as arrays of arrays or arrays of arrays of arrays. And so that means from a theoretical point of view, if you can do one-dimensional arrays, you can do multi-dimensional multi arrays. So if you're sort of a mathematically inclined person, you're already done, right? And that's exactly what this, uh, this pointer of a pointer of pointers does. 
it does that concept. And so from a theoretical point of view, you, you think you're done. Um, but I have some issues with that idea of having uh, uh, multidimensional arrays be arrays of arrays of arrays. Uh, first of all, it's an additional abstraction. It's not inherent in the concept. I have this block here at six by six by six. Which way am I supposed to slice this to make it arrays of arrays? There's no natural way. Yes, I can do it, but it's not natural. So if this was the atmosphere model again, uh, should I slice it in layers? Or should I slice it in slice it in longitudes or latitude? Like it's it's an extra layer that I have to put put on top of it. That uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to teach this this point of the pointer thing. It it's not what you want to get. Okay? So I like to think of multidimensional arrays as a blob of data that has a shape. The shape is fairly simple, but that's what it is. It's data and it has a shape. It's not slabs. It's not cubes of cubes, it's, it's just that. So if you work with the arrays of arrays, arrays of the idea, you have to have extra work. You have to think about how to, how to create them, especially how to create them, and, and a little bit also how to work with them. And um, so. it also allows this arrays of arrays of arrays idea for non-contiguous data. And I don't want that to be a, a default. I want the default to be contiguous, because then I know I can use my libraries. I don't have to worry too much about performance. Um, if I need to get away of this pointer by pointer by pointer, uh, the referencing, if it's contiguous, I can always go and do in, in, in a, uh, say, a performance sensitive part of my code. I can just get the pointer to the first element and do it the old fashioned way, right? So then I, I, I get, I do my own smart indexing in that sense, right? I can do that if it's contiguous. If I've broken it up in, in, in vectors, I'm, I'm kind of lost. I'd have to regenerate the whole thing. And that's, yeah, no. So what I want is a multidimensional arrays, which are just data with a given shape. And I'd like the default to be that they're contiguous. And in fact, um, I'm only going to deal with contiguous ones in, in this talk. Um, you can think of wanting to have uh, strides and that stuff. And yes, you can do that. Um, but let's get the contiguous case. Uh, proper, because that also fits the closest to the automatic arrays. See, ideally, what I really want is a dynamic automatic array. They don't exist. OK, um, that's not all I want. I want it also to be usable. And this comes back a little bit to this idea of, of, of my teaching. Um, it should be a single line to create a multidimensional array. Kind of like in Fortran, there are things that I don't like about Fortran, but that's one of the things I really sort of admire, uh, you write a line, you have an array. Why not? Okay, so easy to create, easy to manipulate, um, not too much craft. We don't need, we don't need um, special things. Um, preferably, I'd like to have the same syntax as the rest of the C++ language, which means square brackets for the indexing. Um, I'd like it to have arbitrary sizes, so only limited by, by physical constraints for the actual memory you have, uh, not the operating system telling me a certain stack is not allowed, or um, I don't want to be uh, constrained by that. So dynamic allocation. Um, I wanted to be able to work with the C++ standard libraries. And to what extent that, that is feasible um, is, is something to be seen. But if we create our own, surely we can try and make things like, if I wanted to sort one of my arrays in some other direction, I'd like that to be possible. Um, it's not that easy, but it might, it might be possible. Um, I definitely wanted to work with C libraries that expect pointers. Um, but if it's going to be contiguous, that's going to be fairly easy. So easy to use, no limits, uh, square bracket accessors, uh, just, just because um, I need to get the data pointer out so that I can get C libraries. And as much as I can, I'd like it to be uh, standard template library compatible. OK. Um, Performance is an issue. Um, I want minimal overhead in creating or using them. Um, so by default, I don't want them to copy themselves. So shallow copies or, or uh, um, what we will turn out to do is reference counting. But sometimes you do need a copy. And so deep copies have to be possible. Um, I want them to be shareable between components of a calculation. Um, that is a. Um, the contentious points to some extent. Um, and that's where the reference counting will come from. 
But imagine that you had this large computation of a, a climate and there's parts of the atmosphere um, that have to be um, uh, monitored and others that have to compute on it. And they all have to sort of share that same multidimensional array. There might not be a logical owner of that. And so shareability should be a, a possibility. Or not. If you have a simple calculation and you don't have to share it, um, sure. So uh, one thing to be able to get rid of the overhead and to use sort of C++ is that you're going to need some optimization. The compiler has to be able to automate some of the overhead, uh, inline some of the functions, and um, it will be able to do that. Any decent modern compiler can do that. Um, I'd like shallow copy on the fold, deep copy if possible, and optimal shared ownership. So those are going to also be the design point of our uh, of our multidimensional arrays. Um, but to kind of understand why things work the way they work in this RRA library that I'm going to show is, is to first try to do it yourself. So let's find solutions to these, uh, to these ones, to these requisites, and see how far we can get. Um, and so here's, here's where code will come in. So if you're not so familiar with C++, um, hopefully you'll understand the concept. Um, but um, I mean, this is not a course on C++, obviously. But let's start with sort of the early days C++ solution. If you were programming C++ in, say, 2000, like I was, um, you would write your own. You probably go, well, I want a matrix. So I'm going to create a matrix class. And that matrix class will have the number of rows and columns stored in it, and it will have the data. Um, sure. Um, so then when I have that class, I can construct a matrix very easily. Matrix M1010 is a 10 by 10 matrix. Um, I've created an operator with uh, round brackets or with parentheses to, to access the elements. And so the 0, 3 element I can assign or I can get it. Um, there's a constructor that does my allocation. There's a destructor that uh, removes the data. Um, and then there's a, a special function to get the sizes of the array in, in each dimension. So extend one is the last dimension is 10, extend zero will be also 10 in this case. Um, so that, that works um, in some sense. Um, this would be your first try. And if you're not doing too much with the matrix, if you're just creating it like this and then using it once, um, fine, this, this, this would kind of work. Um, but there's some issues here. Um, to make this really work, we have to do a lot more work. Um, there are implicit copy constructors here, and they are going to do the wrong thing. So if I have another matrix, I call it uh, n, and I say n equals m, um, after the program ran, it will it will crash. It will say double three or something like that. Um, if I pass this matrix to a function, again, double three. And it is because my copy constructors aren't defined. And, you know, and uh, if you receive plus plus 11, your move constructors and, and uh, move assignments have been, not been assigned. So, um, yeah, but this is early days, right? So as Dimitri said, yeah, this is all uh, not smart, and we'll get to, to the smart pointers. But um, before those were around, this is what you would write. You, you know, you try to do your best, right? But this is not great. So what we're going to do, um, and and another thing that I will point out is that every time I do an, an access of my uh, my of any element, I have to do a computation here, right? And here is where it depends on what your CPU is good at and what it isn't, and whether you want pointer to pointers or not. Um, but there is a calculation that the compiler may or may not be able to, uh, to alleviate uh, for you. And so every element access has a computation. And also, I do not like the fact that I have to do round brackets. Um, the reason I have to do round brackets instead of, instead of uh, square brackets, um, well, I can make that work, but it becomes it becomes a point to a pointer kind of idea again. Um, anyway, that's something to, uh, to discuss. Maybe. Yeah, so as Paul said, if you want to do this correctly, this is not, so this is your simple like, hey, let's do it. And then you go, okay, but then what about a copy? And once you get there, well, what about comms copy? Or what about this? What about that? So um, fine. So let's move forward about 17 years, because um, we can do at least better. Uh, if we if you use more modern features. And so in C++ uh, 17, we can do 
quite a bit better. We can still create our matrix class, but rather than having, and it will, it will behave very similar. So we construct a matrix the same way, access elements, we're still with parentheses, uh, the extent function is there, but instead of using raw pointers and even uh, uh, just end calls, uh, we, can, we can use um, standard library template data types, such as the, the array, which is really just two numbers, um, and the shared pointer in particular. I'm using a shared pointer because I want the matrix to be copyable. And so if I did, and, and so, yeah. Uh, so what the rest is very similar, if you notice, right? We, we, uh, we allocate in the constructor, um, but because of this shared pointer that we have available uh, in, in C++, uh, starting at 11, but becoming better in 17, um, the deallocation now happens automatically. So we can't forget it. Um, and it's a shared pointer. So even if we copy that one, it kind of knows, oh, this was a copy and I, I don't have to deallocate until everybody's done. And we'll get to, to that shared pointer thing in a second. So um, the trivial constructor um, is, is implemented trivially. It, it don't have to do anything. Copying, moving, destructing are all correct. So the compiler now creates those for us. But because they're already correct for these data types, they are also correct for this type. A few drawbacks that I don't, that we could work on is uh, still write requires a computation for every access, uh, still doing uh, round brackets and shared pointers. So the shared pointer is, 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 is essential, but it does something funny too that um, we may not have wanted, but I think we did want it. Um, if we copy this matrix, we don't get an independent copy. We get a pointer to the same data. That's what the shared pointer means. Because you have a bit of data and you can point it. And by the way, that's only in 17 that you could do um, square brackets or let's say array types as its, uh, as its underlying type, and it do the right deallocation by, by default. Um, so this is why it's a, a 17 feature. Um, by the way, if you wanted to repeat the brackets just to get that over with, uh, we can do that. We just cre create square brackets and we just return a pointer. And then the next operator of square brackets will, uh, uh, will do things. So this is, this is not a, a real trouble. Um, it's, it's just a different way of, of essentially writing the same thing. Uh, we might like this better if we have to reuse old C like code. And so I, I tend to like this better just because of that. Um, it makes it uh, easy to, uh, to deal with automatic arrays and dynamic arrays in the same, in the same way. And yes, the rest is the same. The only thing we still kind of have is the human access and as I said, shared pointers. So let's look at the shared pointer and what that really does, um, because that's gonna be the reference counting part of the, of the title of this talk. So this, the STD shared pointer uh, from C++11 and C++17 is a reference counted pointer. It's a good one because it's standardized. It is uh, it's atomic and all of that good stuff. So we, we just have that, uh, but let's break this down. What does this mean? It's smart. Smart means that it will deallocate the memory held by the pointer uh, when the pointer is no longer owned. Okay. So whenever it goes out of scope and there's nobody pointing at it anymore, it will delete the memory. But it's shared. So you can have different owners of this memory. And so we talk about owners, um, which, which might be a new way of looking at it. But whoever first allocates this, uh, this matrix is an owner. But whoever gets a copy of it is now pointing to the same thing is also an owner. So the ownership is, is shared. We talk, we talk about ownership. And once there's no more owners, nobody needs this pointer anymore. That's when you can be allocated. So that's what this, this reference counting does. It counts the, the number of owners, really the number of references, but we think of, of, a, of a reference as somebody that's responsible for this, uh, for this array. So co-ownership, reference counting. That's what this does. So the, smart, the shared pointer does that. Um, for you. 
Um, but how does it work? So different parts of the code are going to co-own. I'm going to go over an example, I hope. Uh, I think it's on this slide. Um, whenever you make a copy, so you say n equals m, that both are one of these matrices, um, its reference counter is increased. So there's no copy made. It just says, oh, n is also pointing at this. Um, that copy is now a co-owner. So I could now delete the original without destroying the data because there's still an owner. If that owner also gets destroyed or goes out of scope, um, that's when things happen. Okay. So it's a very neat way to, to not have to worry about uh, memory management uh, while being able to share code. Yeah, so here's a, here's a, a little example that is slightly contrived. Uh, well, not slightly, it's very contrived but it um, shows what's going on with one of the shared pointers. So I'm just taking a shared pointer of a single double, uh, forget about the matrix for a second. Um, so, and just to keep the code fitting on the slide, I abbreviate SD's a shared pointer to a double by P double. So P double is a shared pointer to a double. Um, let's start with the, uh, with line 10, where we go in. So we have a, a, a shared pointer called pi, but it's not initialized, it's not pointing at anything yet. Uh, we create a new shared pointer um, that just creates, that just uh, has the value of two. So a new double is put in there. Because of, because of the smartness, it should be such that this double is deallocated whenever we're done with, with that double. Um, then I'm going to call a function. The function is called add decimal part. Um, and so it gets as an argument this shared double which means that that's now a copy. X is a, is a copy of B, but a copy in this reference counting way. So it's a, another reference to it. So it's a new owner. X is now an owner of this. So we have both, both B and X, the owners. The reference count would now be two. Um, something is added to, uh, to this uh, X, um, somewhat extra digit of pi, uh, and then it returns the same, uh, the same pointer x. It's slightly comprised. We don't have to do this. We're doing this. Why are we doing this? Because now uh, I assign that to pi. So this x that I'm returning is assigned to pi. Now in principle, I have three references to this same pointer. But because it's the end of the function, x goes out of scope. So it's no longer an owner. So now we have two owners. We have pi, which is an owner because it got a, it got a copy of b some, somewhat indirectly. Um, and we have B itself still, two owners. Now I can, I can stop owning uh, any of these pointers with the reset function. So B.reset basically says, discard my ownership. So B is no longer an owner, but pi still is an owner. And so that means that if I'm printing out pi after the reset, since pi was an owner, the data is still around and this actually prints the right thing. So write 2.14151. Now, this is contrived. You can see that you should have just written out pi before you reset things and you wouldn't need it. But if you change this code just a little bit and made a p double a normal pointer to a double and change the resets to a delete, this code would now fail because it's not keeping track of ownership. And the way it's written, it counts on that ownership. But that's what you can do with reference counting. I'm not saying you always have to do it, but this is how it works. So this is what I want to be able to do. And this is what my matrix that I just defined does. Um, it will, if this were matrices, behave in the same way because it just inherits the shared pointer. Okay, so we have a matrix. Ownership can be shared. Uh, great, uh, all the copy constructors are doing what they should do. Now we want more features. Uh, maybe I do want to do this, uh, and I don't want to do a computation for every element, so I want to pre-compute row pointers. And if their matrix is small enough, and if row pointers are nicely in a, 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 a contiguous data structure of themselves, when you're using them, they go into cache and this pointer to pointer chasing is actually not an issue uh, for small enough matrices. Uh, we want to add move semantics. We didn't do that yet. Uh, a copy method, so we can do a deep copy rather than a reference copy. Um, a data method to get the pointer out when we have to interface with C libraries. Uh, a size me method to get the number of elements, and which also makes it work for some of the uh, STL al algorithms. Iterators to go over all the elements. 
Um, that'd be great, right? There's a lot of uh, algorithms in the standard template library that we can use as long as our matrix is iterable. Um, we'd like conversions. Hopefully, if we already have an automatic array, we can just put, put that into a, a matrix. Can we do that? Um, uh, if we want to get a pointer to a pointer structure out because we have a function that expects that, can we get that out? Those are features we might add. Uh, we, are, we might want to not own. Can we uh, pass it a pointer and then say, well, just use this pointer for your data. And other than that, um, I want all the, uh, the accessors to work properly. Um, can we reshape? Uh, can we add bounce checking to see if, uh, if it works, if, if our indexes are not off? And if they are, uh, uh, can I also switch it off because that's going to be a performance issue? Um, can I assign values to the whole array? Um, can I add streaming operators so I can write it out to screen, uh, print arrays? Uh, can I generalize it to any rank, one, G, three, four? Um, can I generalize it to any data type? Template should help there, right? So. We have a lot of extra work to do if we want this to be a general solution. Um, you don't have to do that work. I did that work. So this is the array library that I use in my classes to not have to have people worry about their multidimensional arrays and just worry about the scientific computing part. And it's on purpose has it's just giving you those multidimensional arrays in a way that kind of makes sense and kind of looks like an automatic array. What it is, is it's a single header. It gives you dynamically allocated, reference counted, multidimensional arrays of any rank, any type, and has all those features that I just mentioned. If you want to get the data, um, you can clone it. Um, it's in my GitHub repository. If you want to everything that we uh, that is mentioned in this in the next few slides to work, uh, just check out the right version. Uh, versions do change. Uh, I am not particularly, uh, and I don't think this one has been, I didn't make this into a release yet. I will at some point. Um, but some of the features, actually some of the bug fixes are uh, are new. Um, you can copy just the uh, the header to your, either your source directory or to something that's in your CPAP or uh, whatever you want. And then you should probably want to read the, uh, the documentation and to see how to use them. But I'm going to show you with examples, because I think that is a, an easy way to, uh, to get the idea across how it works. So this is the simplest case of a, a one-dimensional array. There's other ways to do it already in C++. We're going to do a two-dimensional in a second. Um, create one array of integers, and it has just rank one, so a single dimension. Its dimension is five. So this is five numbers. One way to initialize the, the values in it. So it begins uninitialized as it should. It's not it's initializing it to zero or anything like that because I don't want that. Um, um, and so I initialize it here by just plugging in, plugging in these numbers, and the comma operator has been overloaded to do this. And I'm not entirely in love with how you do this, but this is one way to do it. Um, you compile it, I optimize it. I like to do aggressive optimization, but your code might need O2. Uh, for for certain stability reasons, if possible, it's fine. Um, and then if they, if you read if you uh, execute the, the code, um, it prints one two three four five. It has streaming operators in it, so RRA knows how to stream, and it does it in this sort of uh, parsable format. So it has curly braces, and that actually means that you could also stream it in, and it would figure out that these are five elements, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, another way to do it is to start with an automatic array. Here's an automatic array, and you just pass that in the constructor, and then it will reuse the data in here. Okay, so if you, for some reason, think that your data needs to live on stack, sure, you can do it. Because the data already exists, it is not owned. So this is a way of, of not owning the data. It will never be allocated because it already exists. So whenever you pass either a pointer or a, a, an existing automatic array to it, it says, okay, this is a non-owning way of using it. And, and that's fine, you can do that. Um, another nice way to, uh, to initialize it though is to use a little utility that's in RRA that's called Linspace. Anybody that's seen NumPy in Python uh, will understand what this does. And it, so it creates an, a range from one until five, including, and uh, there's no third element. So it actually means that the spacing is one and it has the same effect. This is also a lot more scalable because if I wanted a million elements, I am not going to type 
of the numbers one to the million in my code, but I just change the five to one. That's the 1D case. It generalizes to 2D. Um, you just give two dimensions. So it's a two by three. I guess you can call it a matrix. Uh, you can fill it in the same way. And just because of the way the syntax works, there's no pretty braces or anything here. Um, and it will print out the matrix again in a sort of a parsable way. It's very similar to the way you would initialize an automatic array if it was in the code. And again, that, that's partly also because then it can read it back in. Here too, you can take an existing automatic array and just pass it in and it will figure out because it's an automatic array uh, in the same scope, what uh, the dimensions are and, and how it works. And again, you can, well, I would want to use a lint space again, but there's, there's in the current version anyway, no two dimensional version of the lint space. And so I'm doing this by, uh, by hand in a sense. I'm going over all of the arrays, all of the elements of the array so this is a four range, uh, a range based four. Um, and I'm using a, a little C++ trick that I can initialize a, a counter as well. And so this effect affects the same um, result. Um, but the only reason that this is C++ 20 is because I'm initializing an integer in the for loop. Um, which, so the, uh, <clears throat> the library itself is just only needs C++ 11. Um, you can sort of tell that it's been around for a little while. Um, it might at some point change that, but for now that, that's all you need. So that's easy enough. I like that. Um, there's a bunch of methods in these RRAs. Um, so here's a bunch of them, but let's just run it. Here we go. Um, so I've got a two by two RRA. And one method is just fill it with a number uh, or with a, a, a value. And so this is going to have an array that is all 13s, three by four, so three by four. Here's our array. Um, I can access elements with repeat the square brackets as I want it. Um, I can see if the array is empty. This one is not empty. I can see what its rank is, what its size is. The size is the total number of elements. So that is three times four. The extent in the first dimension, in the second dimension. There's also a shape function because sometimes you need uh, all extents at the same time. And so that gives you a, essentially an array um, and it has the same uh, in the same values. So that's those are some methods to get some uh, to get the information about the, the object. What if I need the data pointer out? As I said, I, I was promised I promised I could do that. There's a dot data. And you might, if you're a little bit familiar with the uh, containers in the STL, you see that a lot of the names are very similar. Most STL containers have a dot data, uh, if it makes sense, like the vector, and you just get the pointer to the data. Um, this is no longer an owned pointer. Um, so now you're completely out of any sort of reference counting. When you do that, it better just be locally here while you, you are now uh, in control. Um, if you want a pointer to pointer sort of object, you can get that too. Uh, the pointer underscore array gives you an in star const star. The const here is important because it's really the only way to do this const correctly. You do not want to be able to change what the rows mean inside this object. They are frozen. It's a three by four object of contiguous memory. If this wasn't const, I could mess with that. Now, you might have a function that expects an in star star. And so there's a way to get this out. This is essentially some sort of fancy const cast. It's extremely dangerous to use these things if you, but you might have to. So there is some facilities to, let's say, bridge the gap with all the code that uh, that you say old style pointer to pointer um, structures. So we see that the data is indeed a pointer, and then these last three are all this, all a similar way to get access to the same data. So data is just a since it's linear. I know the sixth element already, the the seventh element. Is, is the same as element one, two, and, uh, and B and C point to the same thing. So they all give 13. Well, I, uh, there's no way to know if it's the right element, but you kind of have to trust me. Copying. So here's where the, the share stuff comes in. Um, I make an array, I fill it with ones, 
and I create a new array and then assign it A or it's, it's the um, assignment uh, constructor. Um, they are pointing at the same data. So, so they're the same now. If I change B, I change A. So these are shared arrays. And think of them that way. If you know what a shared pointer does, this is what these things do. Whenever you create a copy, just by assignment, um, you will change the original array. If you don't want that, there's a dot copy command to create a, uh, an independent copy. All the data is going to be copied and not multiplied. And then whatever I do to that C array is just applicable to that C array. And so equals creates a reference. Copy creates a fully independent R array. And then similarly for function arguments, um, if I pass in a function with no uh, references, it creates a, a reference counted reference. And so this changes the original. If I don't want that, there's a couple of ways to do it. Uh, you can put const in front of it, and you're not allowed to do it. Um, it's a bit silly, but it's, it does work. Um, if you don't want to do the reference counting, and this might be a, a perfectly valid thing to do if you know uh, that your ownership is not going to change when you call this function, um, you can do that too. And then because it's a const reference, you cannot change its values either. So that's another way to, to shield you from that if that's what you want. And then finally, reshaping, the final feature that I'm going to show is reshaping. Um, that is sometimes useful. Um, so if I had a 12 by 2 array and I want to see it as a 4 by 6 array, knowing that this is row major contiguous data, that makes this a predictable uh, uh, procedure. If I didn't, if I could have different uh, sprites and, and different uh, storage formats, this would be a, a tricky thing to, to know what it does, uh, apart from that you get a new array. You can shrink an array, so you can reshape, but the, the size can be smaller because it reuses the data, but you have to give an extra argument just to know, to, to make it clear that you know what you're doing because the elements that you're forgetting about are still there. So it's, it's, uh, it can be useful sometimes if you need it, but other than that, there's not a lot of features of, uh, of slicing uh, slicing these arrays. That's not a design point. If you want to flatten the array, so uh, these all have the same ranks, right? They have to. Um, the reshape works on the object. The object has a rank. Um, you can do that. I just have to create a new one. So uh, one nice way is to say, okay, I'm going to reshape my array, make it a single row that's still two-dimensional, and then give that single row, the first row, as the uh, argument to the constructor of a 1D array, and that, that works. So you can flatten like that. Um, and then shapes are independent. So it actually turns out that once you've created a copy, a reference copy, um, you can reshape the copy and the original doesn't change. So that can be very useful if you if you need to, in a function, reshape uh, an array. Uh, but you don't want the original array to be changed, but you do want to use reference count. Like this, this is possible because the shapes are essentially reference counted separately from the data. I'll skip over the performance details. Um, if you clone the RRA, there is actually benchmarks that check the performance of this against uh, other pointer-to-pointer -pointer implementations, uh, other libraries like Eigen, uh, Armadillo, uh, uh, Boosts ha has a similar structure, and the MD uh, span uh, from C++23 if you, uh, if you have it. Um, there's bounce checking you can switch on. This becomes very expensive, but if your program crashes and you want to have the indexes checks, you can do that. So temporarily, you just add this, this precursor. But you only do that if, uh, if, if you're debugging. And yes, reference counting is second. OK, so conclusions. Um, I have a multidimensional array for you. And it's fairly easy to use because you just define it with its uh, dimensions and you're done. Um, they are smart, shared arrays. So keep that in mind. They kind of act like pointers uh, that are shared and that are, uh, that are automatically cleaned up. Um, there's reference counting. You don't have to do reference counting. If you know that you don't want to, you just use all your functions passing by, by C++ kind of reference and then there's no cost to it. 
If you are using it, I know that it is spread safe in the sense that the counter is updated automatically. Um, the layout is always row major and contiguous in memory. Um, that is a flexibility issue perhaps, but it is also a very clear thing. So you always know uh, what your memory looks like if you have to pass it to something that doesn't know our arrays um, and only requires C++. Um, I have to mention um, that there are developments in C++ um, fairly recently that are trying to do better multidimensional array support. And they're really trying and, and, and do all that. I wish they were sooner, but that's what, how we are. So there's a thing called an, an MD span in C++ 23 that creates a non-owning, a non-reference counting option that will allow you to take an existing buffer and give it a shape. And essentially, that's what it's doing. And it is, it's nice. Um, uh, so you can do some of the things without having to. But you're responsible for cleaning up your own data still. Um, you can, it's not iterable. So there's a few things that it doesn't have yet. And later standards, hopefully, will add more things. But that's great. But um, for now, we have a workable solution, even if our compiler is really old. Uh, a few things that I want to do in the future. Um, slicing is is not really supported. I mean, you can you can fake it, but if you can make a slice that's still contiguous, that should be allowed. So if I want to do a uh, a row out of a matrix, why not? And so um, it doesn't quite work the way you would think. Um, I'd like to if C plus plus. Well, 20 becomes like a, a regularly supported thing in, in compilers, and it's, it's really catching up. Um, there is a nicer way to index things where you don't have repeated brackets, like you just uh, have the brackets with a comma in between, like a sensible, uh, it's a sensible thing, and that might allow for some extra uh, optimizations as well. And so I'm looking at that. Um, and the question is, should these two be exactly the same? Like by definition, or is one still a pointer? Um, hey, those are some things to think about. And I'm, I'm kind of working on that. Um, I'd like it to, when these MD spans come, to automatically convert itself into MD span. So if you have a function that takes an MD span, you can pass it in an RRA. Um, I think that would be valuable. Um, and I'm playing with element wise expressions. It makes it more Fortran like, and I don't know if it's, if it's that useful, but it is good. Um, if you had a bunch of uh, matrices and you wanted to add two and put that in a, a new matrix, yeah, this would be a nice syntax, but hmm, those are some things for the future. Yeah, and as Paul said, you can get a, a reference uh, implementation for MD span already. Uh, and that's exactly the one that's used if you if you run the benchmarks of, uh, of RRA, it, uh, it shows you. And, for uh, depending on this on your machine, your compiler, and the size of your matrix, um, MD span and RRA are really on par because really you're just uh, measuring the the throughput of your memory system um, by far. Uh, but there might be cases where MD span's use of this uh, this new multidimensional index operator could give it a, a few percent uh, advantage, which is one of the reasons I want to look at. Uh, if that happens, if I have to increase the, uh, uh, the required level of C++, it will probably be a new version. So the current version is 2.6. These are kind of breaking, um, so it will be a new version. Okay, so sorry I went a little bit over. Um, I have extra slides. <laughs> Just kidding. I do have extra slides. I'm not kidding about that, but I won't go over them. But if you have any questions, uh, uh, let me know. Um, otherwise, thank you for your attention. <laughs>